Awesome Your Awesome Podcast. Hi there. Today on the show, we have got Dr. William Bankston here, who is insisting that I call him Bill. Dr. <laughs> Bankston, one last time, I'm going to say that. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Oh, I'm so excited to have you here as an energy worker. So give us a little bit of background on your remarkable story in these decades you have spent conducting research. I, this wasn't the original plan. No, 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 not at all. Not at all. This is, this is life happens and you never know what's coming next and be open to surprises. Uh, my, my surprise, this is about, uh, about 95 years ago, uh, I ran into a guy uh, who uh, claimed he was a psychic and I'm a skeptic. Uh, and I, I started to, te and I ran into him at a swimming pool actually, where I was lifeguarding. And, and so I said, yeah, whatever. And, and so I started, a, I gave him a couple of objects, psych psychometry to do readings on. And it, it was like, startled me, you know, the, the guy was, was this a coincidence? You know, what's going on here? And, and so I started to set up formal experiments. It became more and more and more tightly controlled and formal. I couldn't beat the guy. I, I mean, it, it's really that simple. I've never heard of any, any parallel to this. Uh, and then uh, not long after I failed in making him go away, <laughs> um, uh, it turned, he morphed spontaneously into a healer. He had no teacher. He had nothing like that. Uh, and he, he, the way he found out he was a healer was by accident. He was doing psychometry readings, token object stuff. Uh, and the people who, some of the people whose objects they gave him had various physical problems. And they were claiming that when he did a reading on them, the problems left them. And I said, well, that's dumb. You know, let, let, let's let's look into that. And I used to have a chronic bad back. Uh, I had to give up a swimming scholarship in college, you know, the whole thing like that. Uh, and I was a butterfly who couldn't arch my back after 100 meters. That's not a good way for a butterfly to be. And so I was in constant pain. You know, it wasn't flopping the floor pain, but it was as people are in chronic pain. And so one day I was sitting in the kitchen, he was telling me of a reading he was doing and, and he said, uh, and then they told me, you know, I, I was holding their whatever it was, and the pain left them. And I was sitting there in pain, you know, and I said, you're an idiot. <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's see if this guy can, you know, let me give him something of mine or do, do something like that. And I, I said, I'd like you to fix my back. And he said, how? Uh, and I said, I don't know, you're the weird guy, you know, uh, fix my back. So I, I leaned over a kitchen table. He said, what do I do now? I said, put your hands on my back. He said, I said, then what? And I said, fix it. I mean, it was, that, that was his elaborate training. <laughs> fix it. Uh, I felt as if my back were Novocaine. And then the Novocaine wore off from the outside in. Gone. And so I was left with a kind of bifurcation as possibilities, you know, these little forks in the road. Let's pretend it didn't happen and keep my sanity, or let's figure out what happened. And for better, or for worse, I may just because I have no learning curve, I decided to try to figure out what in heaven's name it just happened to me because it happened to me. I am a card carrying skeptic. It happened to me. I was in pain. I'm not in pain. And I said, let's, let's figure out what's going on. So I started to drag him around, putting his hands on people. And we started to see some interesting things. Uh, I, I, I watched and then helped him out and participation in a couple hundred healings. It, and I'm oversimplifying it, you know, so it's not magical. It's not, you know, you wave your hands and everything goes away and everything is fine. Some things responded quickly. Some things responded slowly. Some things responded Amazingly, some people, nothing. And some of the examples are pretty interesting. He couldn't do a warp. And anybody who's in the healing world knows that any idiot can do a warp. You go up to a warp and you go, boo, <laughs> and it goes away. 
you, you know, you, you spin three times in a circle and you jump up and down, it goes away. <laughs> he could treat day and night and he couldn't do warts. And it turns out after I developed a healing system to go test this stuff, the people who learn my method can't, can't do warts either. So I have a joking $5 million reward for anybody who can do a wart using this method. You can't sneak in and use another method that works in warts. So for better, for worse, I started clinically, which is backwards, uh, and watched and took part in a couple hundred healings, looking at the pattern. And then I realized that uh, I'm never gonna unravel this clinically. Clinical work is past my intellectual pay grade. You got somebody who comes in who's sick, who's in pain, who has a problem, who has a whatever they have, and they're doing a boatload of stuff. You know, so they the stuff they're doing could be they're going to a healer, they're going to a chiropractor, they're going to an acupuncturist, they, they changed their diet, they started to exercise, they ate a grapefruit, they stopped eating apples, they, you know, who knows? And pain anyway is cyclical. And so pain comes and goes. Conditions come and go. Time fixes stuff. So is the treatment because of healing? Is it because of time? Is it because? Is it because? Is it because? And, and so I realized there's no way to unravel this clinically, at least in, in my world. There's no way to unravel this clinically. So I went into the lab. And so with a buddy of mine, we went into the lab and said, we need airtight experiments so-and-so comes in, you do some hocus pocus, and they leave better. <laughs> was it because of the hocus pocus? Or was it time? Was it the grapefruit? Was it, was it, was it? Uh, in the lab, you can do some, if you're a control freak, you can do some pretty, pretty interesting things. So I decided being a control freak, that I would take it into the lab. I'm oversimplifying. And we went to City University of New York and poked around their bio department and said, we need something airtight. If we get something, nobody is going to have a counter hypothesis. So they were working on for 20 years, a cancer model in mice. And the particular cancer model was a mammary cancer. Uh, and the mammary cancer, uh, people all around the world had studied. There were over 2000 academic publications on this mouse. No mouse had ever lived past a month. Not a single mouse. No matter what you did, whether you gave them grapefruit or not, whether you gave them chemotherapy or not, whether you gave them or whether you gave them or you gave them, no mouse had ever gotten better. And so it looked like a beautiful normal curve. Standard deviation of death was three days. It's a beautiful tight little model. You inject mice, these mice with certain amount of cancer, 100% of them will die and you know how many, what percent will die on any given day. Let's see what happens. So I think in simple terms, let's take a model that's already understood, 2000 publications, and I interject a single variable. And the mice can't get away. <laughs> and so they're injected with cancer. I come in, do a little hocus pocus, and we see what happens with the mice. Now, what happened with the mice was reasonably interesting. I expected because, and I'm almost always wrong. <laughs> if I say anything here, bet the ranch on the opposite. Um, <laughs> that's the point. Of, that's the fun of doing research. You find out how little you know. And I guarantee you, because I've done so much research, you don't know anybody who knows less than me. Wow. I mean, so, you're. Go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Continue. So. Oh, so real quick, the, you know, the, the plot, uh, the, the, these mice, the, they develop tumors. The tumors get bigger and bigger and bigger. It's an ugly way to die. Uh, they don't metastasize in this particular model. Uh, and then they, you die a bunch of ugly ways that, that you go out. Uh, every stage is understood. Every stage has been studied, all this kind of stuff. I come in, do some hocus pocus. And when you do the hocus pocus, I expected, I was thinking of healing as an analog analogous to radiation. So, you know, you come in and your hocus pocus is like, zzz, zzz, you know, you're zapping them kind of a thing. And if I got to the mice early enough, we would probably prevent it from, I was thinking we were killing cancer. 
I was thinking we found clinically that you know cancer responds very very well to this 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 healing stuff. I mean, really well. We're not good at benign growth, but malignancy is the the more aggressive, the easier to fix. And so this this particular model in the mice, I expected you could go zap 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 and and you would um, prevent it from happening if you got to it early enough. So. Figuratively, Monday you inject them, and on Wednesday, you know, you start putting your hands around the cage, and, you, and, and that, that's where you're going to get your most bang for your buck. And what happened instead of tumors grew anyway. And I just assumed, because I don't believe this stuff anyway, so I just assumed that the tumors were growing because it didn't work. And I tried to call off the experiment. I said, it doesn't work. The tumors are growing anyway. You know, it was a good try. We gave it a shot. Didn't work. Let's move on. A friend of mine said, give it a couple more days. I would have canceled. I said, all right, give it. We went through a lot of trouble to set this up. Let's see what happens. So a couple of days later, the, the tumors start to develop a blackened area on the tip of it. And I go, they're dying. Give it a couple more days. The tumor then ulcerates. They're dying. Now they were running around the cage looking really ugly because they had big wonking things sticking out the side of them. But they're running around clear eyed, bushy tailed, having a good time playing pinochle in the in the cage and, you know, doing whatever it is that they're doing and and give it a couple more days. Suddenly the tumor implodes. And it's gone. And it's sudden. It's not, I used to say, look, the mouse remitted, but it's not a remission, it's a cure. Because they're cured for life. More, if we re-inject them with the cancer, they're immune for life. More, if we take blood out of a treated mouse and put it into an untreated mouse, that untreated mouse that's gotten the transfusion would be cured. So we have the conceptual basis for making stuff that will work because apparently, and this is what I'm working on now, you can store healing intention, put it into the analog to a battery, mass produce it, and make it conventional. I'll shut up now. Mm, wow, oh my God, a million questions. So first, you know, your humility here is just astounding to me because you're proving this stuff works, but I, I want to understand where the skepticism comes from, right? Because you have spent a lifetime. So, okay, for, I'm all over the place, but first question, like, You've spent a lifetime doing this. So are you trying to find an anomaly where it doesn't work? Or are you trying oh. to, I mean, it, you know, cause you're getting the results over and over and over again. No. I have many studies at this point. I have, I just finished my 19th and 20th mouse study in uh, Tokyo. Uh, before that, I was at Brown University. Before that, I was at University of Connecticut. Before that, I was at UC San Diego. Before I've been in uh, six or seven medical schools doing research, a bunch of different independent biology labs uh, doing research. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that I'm not trying to be humble. It's just the more you learn, the more you realize you don't know a whole lot. And, and the reality is, I'm not interested in whether healing happens. It's, I mean, it's no longer an interesting question. Uh, the, the question is what's, what's behind it. So I've also studied what happens physiologically to the healer, what happens to the healee. Uh, so I've looked at, I use EEGs uh, and I look at brain resonances at a distance. I use functional MRIs. We get the, you know, the cute little pictures of, of brains and stuff. I've used, I've used, I've used, but I'm looking for not whether healing happens, but rather what are its correlates, what makes it stronger, what makes it weaker, what happens to the, to the healer, what happens to the healy, and what is underlying it in, in terms of a mechanism. So, you know, I've been doing this 105 years, and I figure I'm, I'm going to do it tops 80 more, 
And, and then, uh, so I'm, I'm taking a shortcut and I'm trying to develop now practical applications because the reality is, according to our Western canon, if you read a lot of textbooks, this stuff doesn't make any sense. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. By what we know, this is impossible, but it happens. And it's not like it occasionally happens. I can do it on demand. And so you, you let, I mean, I've given, I've given talks to departments of oncology on my mice uh, cancer research, and you get 75 oncologists in a room and they try to cut your knees out from under you. Um, and at the end, I generally get something like a standing ovation. They go, wow, I, 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 there's not, he's not doing anything wrong. You know, he's doing conventional research in an unconventional area. We agree, it's no longer an interesting question, does it happen? But rather, what are the secondary things? What 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 what's the mechanism behind it? So, I've done a boatload of genomic studies now on cancer. Uh, we we did a study at Brown looking at changes in cancer cells in vitro uh, in in a in like a test tube, not really, but in in a test tube in incubators, and we get we can record healing intention play it back to the cancer cells and we get reliable genomic changes in 68 of the cancer genes. Um, and these 68 change when they're exposed to a recording that contains intention. I mean, that's, that's interesting because if it works and I can develop a technology of healing, I can globally scale it. So if, it, if it's a recording, I could upload, you don't want, you don't want whatever the condition is, Download the cure. Not does healing work, but how do we use it? So I'm working on that with water and a bunch of different substances and such. It's again, it's 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 pretty interesting, but I clearly know that I don't know, and that that I can I can extrapolate because I've spent a little time with folks who think they know, and it, you can it takes about a half a second to downgrade their knowledge because they don't know. The only way you can have the illusion that you understand this stuff is to put blinders on and not think of all the details. So for example, we did a, 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 a well, I've done a bunch, but we did a mouse experiment at, the mice were two inches away, and then we replicated it at 2,000 miles. Same result. Now what can cover 2,000 miles? and hit a cage. You know, you got to block that out as if it didn't really happen. And it can hit this cage in the lab and miss this cage at 2,000 miles. That's crazy talk. Works. <laughs> but by anything we understand, shouldn't work, but it works. So something's going on that no matter how many textbooks you've read, your pea brain is not going to understand this stuff. I don't, I've never met someone who understands healing. I've met a lot of people who think they understand healing, but I've never met anybody who has the tools to understand how healing works. And if you can do a cage of mice at 2,000 miles, just to give you a simple example, it's not energy healing. There is no energy that doesn't diminish with distance. Healing doesn't diminish with distance. It's not energy. What is it? information. How does the information get there? I don't know. What does the information say? I don't know. But I'm reasonably confident, I'm probably wrong, I'm reasonably confident that it's probably an information-based system. That we're not doing anything, where it's not mind over matter, or aren't I wonderful and my magnificent brain will, you know, impose the order on the universe. No. No, there are rules, patterns that are consistent, that are, that are discoverable. But it doesn't conform to any, any way that you think now. I, I've studied a couple of areas of science, and this is not covered in the textbooks. Mm, and now, uh, let me ask you, you know, on one level, we're saying we can store the intention, right, of healing that can be stored, yeah. if I understand you correctly. But 
when there's this process that you use called cycling, yeah. where it's almost like you want to step outside of the intention. You don't want to be focused on the healing. Are we cycling to not, what is kind of the, the point behind the cycling aspect of it? It's a great question. And the, the answer is, is it's going to be a shocker. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, that's the reality, you know, so I, I, I don't know, but I've done because I'm not a believer. I don't, I don't naturally have a believing bone in my body. And, you know, I, if you ask me, do you believe in gravity? I wouldn't sit there agonizing over it, you know, because yeah, there's gravity. Give me a break. You know, it's a stupid question. I got news for you. Nobody really knows how gravity works. I hang out with a bunch of theoretical physicists and, and if I put 10 of them in a room and I said, what's gravity, they'd get into a fist fight. But not a single one would, would deny that there is gravity. If I put 10 healers in a room, I ask what's healing, they're gonna get into a fist fight. If you look at the evidence, and again, I'm not talking about believing anything. If you look at the evidence, yeah, there's gravity. You know, I'm pretty sure that I can experience it. And I'm pretty sure I've experienced it before. And and I don't care whether you believe it or not. I don't care whether you believe healing or not. Actually, I've done tests. Non-believers or skeptics, I think may be the optimum healer which is reasonably interesting. Believers have a tendency, oddly enough, to believe. <laughs> and people who believe in stuff have a tendency to want to reinforce their already existing beliefs. Mm -hmm. They don't want to take in information that's contrary. I, I'm openly, I, I'm wrong. I'm wrong about everything. And I know that because I tested my ideas. I'm wrong. So I take the stuff into the lab and say, What's going to happen? I'm always surprised. And why am I always surprised when I go into the lab? Because I don't know what I'm talking about. And again, I've been doing this for 125 years. If people have only been doing it for like 60, they got no shot. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess I've got no shot then. So is this why I'm, I love sending healing to non-believers so I can prove them wrong? <laughs> no, I can't prove anything, but it's fun to send healing. I think the optimum thing is a, is a skeptical uh, healer and a skeptical healee. I actually don't know whether non-skeptics or believers uh, can heal. I, I have no experimental evidence because believers scare me. <laughs> you know, they're, they're a little scary because they, they, without, they, they just believe. And then I, I don't know what to do with that, you know, because I'm not in that camp. Well, I mean, what about believers who've seen evidence that led them to believe, right? Like uh, I'll just use myself as an example. I was very skeptical and then seeing healing take place. I mean, it, it made me a believer. I can't, I, I don't even know, you know, well, I accept that I've seen, you know, uh, uh, you know, hundreds of people fixed. I accept that I've seen hundreds of mice fixed. I've accepted that I've done, you know, many, many studies with cell cultures. I, I, I accept, I, I don't dispute my findings. I always replicate them, but I, I don't dispute them. And your question, which we've probably both forgotten, is about cycling. I, rather than say, what's, you know, what's going on with cycling? I did an experiment at Indiana University Med School. I did a series of them. And the, the first, we fixed a bunch of mice. And then we took out the cycling on the, on the replication. The mice died. Now that, that'll get your attention. Mm -hmm. If you cycle, the mice get cured. If you don't cycle, the mice die. Pay attention to that. Now, that doesn't answer your question about what does cycling have to do with it because cycling is a rapid imaging technique. Why that has anything to do with healing I don't have a clue. I mean, I really don't. 
So the technique is mechanical. I can't teach it now, but you know, I mean, it's published, it's public. It's, you know, anybody who wants to can go hang out and look at it and learn for yourself um, and get yourself some mice and try it for yourself. But if we take out the cycling, the mice die, we put in the cycling, the mice live. That's, that's a clue you wanna pay attention to. So my question is what happens when you cycle? And it's in that context that I've done research at University of Connecticut uh, and Thomas Jefferson Med Schools in, in brain imaging and you know this, that, and the other thing uh, to see what, what's going on. And I, I don't even know that cycling has any, or, or that healing and or cycling has anything to do with the brain. We have a brain bias and so we have toys to play with brains. But I don't know that the brain is the cause of healing. If you look at the brain when healing happens, something happens. But I don't know if it's the cause or the effect. So if we had, instead of a brain meter, you know, take a functional MRI as a brain meter. If we, instead of a brain meter, we had a liver meter, um, maybe we'd see a correlation in the liver too. Maybe we see something in the pancreas. Maybe we see something, you know, we don't know. And this goes through the whole list. If you give me a, a, if I made a list for you of things I think I know, in my skeptical head, I need to have replications in independent labs before I, I make a, a factual claim. If I make a list of my, the factual claims I can make, they're, they're, they're reasonably interesting. You know, there's a bunch of them. But if I make a list of the things I don't know, you know, I'm quitting in 60 years. Uh, I won't have scratched the surface. So what I find so fascinating about you is that you have spent so much time. You have dedicated a lifetime to figuring this out. And you've gotten a lot of data. You've got some evidence here to prove it works. But you're still, are you still seeking the why? Is this? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, 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 that's the holy grail. But, but since I'm only going to do this another 60 years, I'm going to, um, <clears throat> that's why I'm building something practical. Cause I figure let's build, let's there's even if you teach one-on-one, -on -one, so I, I teach workshops in cycling. I'm giving one, I think in a week or so in Germany, I do, I do a, only a couple in the year. And again, I'm not trying to be cryptic and I'm not trying to sales technique, but if you go to my, my website, bankstonresearch.com, you'll see the, you'll, you'll see some papers. I think we have 30 or 35 papers. Some of them are geeky, some of them are readable. You know, some you're going to go, are you kidding? <laughs> Cause they're only for geeks. <laughs> um, and, and, and some are written in semi English and, and things like that. But I'm trying to make something practical. I just finished a, a double blind randomized clinical control, actually two studies, clinical on, on, on COVID patients going into a hospital. So I got 160 in my last experiment, and it's really an experiment, 160 people entering a hospital with COVID. It's not casual COVID, they're going in a hospital. Randomized, some got water, hocus pocus water and some got water that wasn't hocus pocus. And then we follow the, the COVID symptoms, the PCR tests. We do, we do, we do. You know, again, this isn't casual stuff. I think it's fair to say it's out for, well, I have a paper out for peer review now, but I, I mean, we have a fix for COVID. It's, it's not particularly interesting. Um, the difference between the people who took the hocus pocus water, they didn't know what they were taking. And the people who took just water, and I'm talking sublingual drops under the tongue. I think we might have the strongest effect size for COVID on anything because the control group was, were people in the hospital getting medical care. We blew out, <clears throat> blew out of the water the medical care people. I mean, right away, the group that has got the hocus pocus water is getting better. The symptoms are going away and the cough is gone and the PCR test comes back negative. It's, uh, it's reasonably interesting. Mm, and now we're talking about charged water. Yeah. So, okay. so the information's in the water. It's not psychological. 
It's not, you know, a good suggestion or you believe this. Or you, no. You know, the same way that we, we get the same results in, in animals. And now, you know, I, I think it's so amazing that you are after this answer and how dynamic has that made life for you to just, I mean, are you going to font, are you going to figure out the why? I know you're doing other remarkable things and offering, you know, like the downloads and things and teaching people how to cycle to kind of get this out there on a mass scale, which is an amazing thing, you know, and you're making huge impact with that. But do you feel like you're gonna figure out the why? Or yeah. is it just exciting to keep chasing? It's exciting. It's a lot of fun. You know, it's interesting. So I, I've, I've done research in a number of areas. This is, this is the hardest. I mean, it really is the hardest. Uh, because you're starting with an unknown, you don't, you know, you don't have the tools. I mean, go back to my treatment at a distance. If you, if I can put two mice cages and you're in California, you put one mouse cage on your desk and one mouse cage on your desk and say, fix only this one, you know, we're about 3000 miles away and this, this one gets fixed. This one doesn't, you got nowhere to go. I mean, literally you don't even know where to start. Because if it were energy, and it's clearly not, so I uh, better with things it's not, it's not energy. Because there is no, and because I've measured energetics, this and that, and, and there's nothing that's going to reach 3,000 miles, let alone be targeted to your desk and not target the, 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 the cage right next to you. So the way we think the world works and the way we think we're in the world is cute, but it's wrong. It's just wrong. Now, we don't know what's right. And it's not just about healing. We don't know how the world works. I was just on the phone with a biologist buddy of mine, uh, and he's a virologist, an immunologist, uh, probably a couple other ologists. And, he, and, and we, we have done some reasonably interesting experiments together. And we're talking about a particular problem. I'm, I'm trying to get some lab work to, to work on. And I said, you don't know much about biology, do you? You know, and he's got you know, 87 PhDs. You know, I, I said, you don't know much about biology, do you? He goes, it's, ain't that the truth? You know, and, and he says, I know enough to know it doesn't take too long to realize you don't know what you're talking about. And he doesn't know any biologists who know what they're talking about. <laughs> I love that. So there's this element of, because it's the only way to keep going. I mean, because once you figure it out, you're done, right? It's like, what else, what are you going to do? Oh, well, there'll be something else. I'm not worried. <laughs> There, there is so much out there, but just this one thing, right? This intent on finding this answer. Now tell me, you know, you believe everyone, we all can activate our, uh, have the potential to heal or activate healing. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, the people I, I've used in my experiments and they've been faculty members, students, and et cetera, uh, they are skeptics only because I, 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 I just have difficulty with believers. Um, if someone just goes around and knows the truth, then I know that they don't know anything and they're not even interested in learning because uh, they don't need to learn because they, they already understand everything about whatever it is that they believe. So believers scare me a little bit and I've never tested a believer. So I don't know if believers can heal. Skeptics can heal, but I don't know if believers can heal. They, I don't know I'm saying they can't, I'm saying I don't know. So, uh, but for you, cause you've done uh, countless healings yourself, right? Uh, you started doing the hands-on healing with the mice and people as well. And 
got results. It worked on, you know, countless occasions, yep. but you're still not a believer. How, can you help me understand that? Well, I believe what, what I've experienced. It's, it's, it's kind of like, I'm, I'm really not a believer in gravity either. And I don't know how gravity works. And I don't know anybody who knows. I know people who know how gravity works to them, but some people will say it's a graviton. Some people will say it's curved space. Some people will say it's, some people will say it's, and the reality is gravity still exists. And we don't hung, get hung up. So do you believe in gravity? You know, and, but we do go around, do you believe in healing? I think they're the same question. And I don't think we'll ever know what gravity is we'll understand parts of it and we'll get a conceptual framework to make sense of it, but with no illusion that you're done. The people who study gravity are not gonna one day pack up their bags and go home because there'll always be another puzzle because the, I mean, the history of any intellectual inquiry is you find out not only how little you know, but how big the problem is and it has ramifications you never thought of. And I've spent a couple of minutes thinking about healing and I don't have the tools, but I can build a gravity device. I can build a healing device. Now my question is, can I scale it globally? So for example, COVID. So let's say an academic paper comes out and it goes, here we are. It's a clinical study. It's double blind, randomly, you know, it, it, it's done not casually. And it actually was a replication of an earlier one that I did because I didn't believe that either. And now I can offer it to people. You want to get fixed to COVID. I can offer it to countries. You don't want any COVID. I don't believe you. Okay, have COVID, enjoy. You know, I, my, my, my thing isn't to save the world. This is just interesting in and of itself. And if you want to use it, use it. If you don't want to use it, I'm okay. And now, um, Bill, you know, we, I've heard you talk about um, in other interviews and stuff with medical practitioners, because, you know, this whole healing thing had always been thought to be, and still very much is, um, you know, airy fairy or whatever. And a lot of them just discredit it altogether. But I do know a lot of hospitals and places are implementing things like Reiki and different oh. forms of alternative healing. So like, what are your thoughts on that when you're, you know, you're speaking to all these oncologists and they're like, oh, you know, great, that's wonderful. And, but then they're still don't want to employ that for patients or. Yeah. I mean, some, some of the uh, resistance to it is just because they don't know what they what they don't know, you know, uh, so they don't know any better. And if you just stop and think about it, and I say, I just fixed my 3,000 miles, they'll go, come on. You know, because it's absurd. I understand it's absurd. If I wasn't here, I would say you're absurd, <laughs> you know, because you know, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, so I, I, don't, I don't assume that they're, I get, I, I get upset with arrogance. And I don't like stupid people who have the arrogance to think they understand what they're talking about. Uh, but using it or not using it, there's a lot of questions. And since it is so foreign, it's hard to just plop into the middle. So you say, you know, there's Reiki practitioners, healing touch practitioners. I don't know if they all do the same thing. You know, is Reiki the same as, is is healing touch the same as, is my cycling stuff the same? I don't know, but my 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 preliminary, not not a study, but my preliminary suggestion, I'm probably wrong, my preliminary suggestion is that I think they may do different things. So I have people, you know, who studied a variety of different things. I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not a healer. I'm not a clinician. I can do it, but, you know, I don't think it's a big deal. Um, but, but I don't know whether Healing technique A is the same as B, which is the same as C. And a good clinician probably would want to know this versus that. So let's say you're, you're a clinician and your patient has a wart. Well, save your time. Don't cycle. 
you know, it's not going to do it. But Reiki, you know, the Reiki people tell me any idiot can do it. Right? So we'll go, go Reiki. You know, so if you're a clinician, you want a Reiki. It's not Bankston versus, you know, there's not a hierarchy of. Mine works in, particularly well on, on, on certain things and not so well on others. Uh, so we're better, for example, as a generic, we're better at taking things away from people of stuff they don't want than stimulating things that they're missing. So, for example, if you have type 1 diabetes, you're missing something. We don't have a cure for type 1 diabetes yet. And I use the word yet because we'll get there. We, if you're Parkinson's, your brain's supposed to put out, it's not putting it out. And so you got shakes and you got this and you got that, but you're missing something. We're not very good at it. Now, an interesting thing, and this is opens up, it's, it's going to tempt me to go past 60 years. Um, uh, the, the interesting thing, because I don't know if I want to take early retirement anymore, because some of the early, some of the stuff coming up is, is particularly interesting. We've treated a number of Parkinson's people and we get reduction in shakes and symptoms. Eh, not, not particularly impressive. And then eventually it, it tends to, to regress. Just took on a couple of ALS folks. Want to see what happens for different reasons. Uh, but we've ne So we've never had a cure of, of, of a serious case of Parkinson's. On the other hand, we did some experiments with charged water. And this is an, an N of one, it's an anecdote. Uh, an astrophysicist who had been in a wheelchair for five years with Parkinson's, couldn't get out, started uh, doing this, the, the drops. Um, uh, he's gotten rid of his wheelchair, he's gotten rid of his walker, he's walking a mile at a time. Better than hands-on, even though the stuff came from hands-on. So we're, I'm looking for ways to up, up the juice, you know, up the ante, so to speak. So could we make something and that will fix Parkinson's? Yeah, I just don't know how to do it yet. Could we make a cancer vaccine? I got a $5 million grant application out for that. It'd be fun to make a cancer vaccine. Now, if people don't want it, I, I'm okay, you know. I, I'm not trying to convert anyone to believe in anything because I don't believe in anything myself. But if you don't want it, you know, some stuff, it's pretty simple. There, there are techniques, it'll fix, it'll work. Some stuff, it's not so simple. That's a clue. Why does Parkinson's not respond to hands-on as well as, say, a, 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 an aggressive cancer? And the answer is, shockingly, I don't know. But that's a clue. Throw it in the pile. Wow. Now, Bill, tell us what is, I know you're doing all of this stuff to kind of get this out there, but what would be the ultimate for you? To know what's going on. <laughs> Seriously, what's going on? What in heaven's name happened when he put his hands on my back? <laughs> what happened something happened to me wow and, and in, in that moment you know what was your initial reaction was it like okay this is i'm dreaming or this happened and i gotta go figure out how or this is not real what was that first thought when you were just spontaneously cured like that what happened I mean, it's not more complicated than that. And, and, and a sane person would have just said, that was interesting, and move on and have a life. I, I'm not real bright. <laughs> I had difficulty walking away. Wow, I love this. This is so amazing. And now I know you've, I'm going to have links to all of your stuff for people, your website, all of that, where people... Uh, can do some of this training online and stuff as well, correct? You can, and there, there, there's an, actually an audio course that, that I made that is uh, people all over the world ship me something, and of course I don't believe them, uh, but they say, they, they say I, I listen to your audio stuff, 
you know, then I went out and I got a cancerous dog and I cured the dog. Here's the pictures. And I go, nah. <laughs> so, there are people who do, who do my stuff and believe it, you know, and I say, no, please don't talk to me. You know, I don't, I don't want believers hanging around me. <laughs> they, they, they shut down the, the, the playful curiosity. So the ultimate student for you is one who does it, it works, but they don't believe it and they got to do it again and again to. They become curious as to what's going on. Right. The ultimate student is a student is, is, is somebody who, who is curious. And there's the lack of curiosity among a lot of people. Mm, well, I love your curiosity and I just love that it's just never enough and you're going to just <laughs> keep going until, uh, who knows, right? You're just, when, when you figure this one out, there's going to be, like you said, oh, there'll be more. I'm not, I, I'm not worried about getting, running out of problems. <laughs> Right. Well, I just, I, first of all, I want to say you have been so amazing. I would love to circle back with you and sure. do this again. I know you're working on so many things, the vaccine, and then would love to do a follow-up on, you know, the COVID stuff, get sure. that feedback and the findings on that and all of that. And I just, um, Thank you so much for your time today. You have been so awesome. I feel so honored and just delighted to have had this time with you. Thank you. Thank you. It's been fun. And we, yeah, absolutely. We can circle back and see where, what, what new things I found out that I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I love that. And now I was going to say Dr. Bankston, um, but Bill, in closing, if there were one message you would like to leave people with, what would that closing message be? All your beliefs are wrong. Uh, that's it, huh? Right there? No, I don't need to add anything. Oh, uh, I and It's not all your beliefs are wrong, all my beliefs are wrong, but I start assuming all my beliefs are wrong. Mm, oh, I'm not I threatened by finding out that I'm wrong. It's like, Okay, another one here. <laughs> I, don't, I don't understand this either. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. You have been so awesome. Thank you so much for your time today. Thanks for the invite. We'll, we'll touch base again. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.